This is a cultural event from the British Library. Welcome to the, uh, the Knowledge uh, Centre Theatre at the British Library and a very, very warm welcome to our very special guest, Dr Carla Hayden. Uh, I'm Roly Keating, uh, Chief Exec of the British Library. Carla, as I'm sure you know, is the 14th Librarian of Congress. I think you know, but the first woman, the first African-American uh, to hold the office in 217 years. So um, you are a librarian by profession, by training, from early days at uh, Chicago Public Library, uh, and uh, you returned there, I think, in the early 90s, is that right? Yes. Uh, to run the Chicago system, but you've done stints at the uh, Museum of Science and Industry there, and University of Pittsburgh, um, and then probably best known uh, in the States as a hugely successful chief exec at the um, Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore, um, which underwent an astonishing transformation under Carla's leadership. Then, last year, came the moment uh, when the then President of the United <coughs> States uh, made the nomination uh, and noted at the time her enduring commitment to innovation and participation in libraries. And that's a theme I think we would love to explore. Uh, but let's begin first with, uh, and I do want to then track back a little bit uh, through, through um, previous experience, but let's talk about the job you've taken on. So the Library of Congress, it's known, I'm, I, I'm sure, by reputation to many people here, but it's a, it's a somewhat different kind of beast from the British Library. It's also, and I'm going to say this now, and then I'm going to say it on the record, it is the biggest library Thank you. in the world. <laughs> but I think between us, can we confidently say we run the two biggest libraries? I think so. In the world? But for a, a British audience, maybe who haven't made it, to Washington, maybe can you just paint a little picture of the scale and, and of, the National, of the Library of Congress? Well, the Library of Congress holds 162 million items, and I just converted from miles to kilometers because <laughs> I knew my audience, because it's 832 miles, but that's 1,400 kilometers from here to Vienna. It is the first federal cultural institution in Washington, D.C. It started in 1800, and there was something that happened in 1814. Oh, yeah. I, I, there was some invading power. Is that some right? Some group uh, that didn't... There was some unpleasantness. <laughs> but, uh, but those who are laughing know what we're talking about. Yes. Here. Those there who are looking the, quizzical... This was uh, 1814, and it was the British expeditionary force into Washington who uh, appear to have set a few things on fire, <laughs> including the White House and Congress, containing all, pretty much the... Pretty much the whole of collection the of the first generation of the of Library the of Library Congress. Congress. Because the Library of Congress was established in 1800, and it was established to serve that legislative body. So here, for instance, you have parliamentary yep. libraries. Here it's separate. It's, it's separate yeah. from the National Library, but that's how the Library of Congress uh, started. So the library was established 1800 in the Capitol building, and there were several thousand volumes that were there for Congress people to refer to. And as I was told when I was visiting a legislator during my nomination process, I went into this wonderful office and the gentleman showed me the fireplace. I said, oh, that's wonderful. He said, well, that's where the British put the books from the library to start the fire. <laughs> that didn't end well. Um, and so Thomas Jefferson uh, at the time yeah. uh, had the most extensive library in the country and uh, you may know a little bit he was uh, a president that uh, was part of forming the nation mm. and he s offered to sell his collection to congress mm. he i is this a i guess i can say this this is public knowledge he had a uh, opportunity to sell his wine collection as well <laughs> he said then he had an extensive collection. It included 
religion and books in other languages. And he said, There's, there is no subject that a member of Congress should not have to refer. Mm. Mm. And over time, the library grew. And then in 1870, the Library of Congress was charged with administering the copyright process for the United States. And part of that process included adding copies of books to be registered for copyright. And then the the collection grew and grew. Then it grew, grew. astonishingly. I mean, and and it must it's have been the, really been the yeah. foundation. And now up uh, to 162 million. The archives of 23 presidents from George Washington okay. yeah, uh, yes, all the course, way up to course. Coolidge. So it's quite an extensive. And uh, as ever, because people always say to the, that to us, it is not just book no, it's not. collections, but just remind uh, us of the uh, Manuscript the collections, uh, prints, photographs, uh, even items that you wouldn't expect that are almost museum quality, mm. the contents of Abraham Lincoln's pockets the night he was assassinated, these types of items. Mm. Uh, Charles Dickens cane. We're not giving it back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but <laughs> several, yeah. several items. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there, there's a full range and going back to at least 1200, mm. AD and, and all of that. So and, and diversity of language? It's not just... 470 languages. Okay. And half of the collection is actually not in English. Oh, right. And so people and don't Because America is a very multilingual country yes. anyway. And so yeah. the collection um, is not only uh, about the United States, but all nations. And in fact, we just repatriated materials from Afghanistan back to the country because some of the things had been destroyed. Oh, really? So it's, it's really a worldwide collection, just like here. Just like here, and I mean, through a different historical process here in Britain, yes, we've ended up, we think, with all the great language groups of the world, all the different content types, and we can talk maybe about the, the role of great libraries in the current age in actually finding ways through digitization, for instance, to, to yes. share content. So uh, th that, for me, it, it raises the question about the, the role and identity of, of Library of Congress. We call ourselves the National Library of the UK. You have the congressional role, but you are, to what extent would you all, are you also the National Library of, of, of America? We uh, say that we are the Library of Congress, America's library, because it is a public library. Yeah. People can get a reader's card just at mm -hmm. the age of 16 and to do research. Anyone can walk in. Um, and that's something that we're working on to let more people know that this is their library. This is their national library. We also um, are, and that's why we're here, to learn from the British Library that, and this is, and you didn't pay me to say this, okay. um, but in terms of large national libraries that have extended themselves to communities that have made the people of the country and everywhere else feel welcome and to use their resources, mm -hmm. The British Library is the model for all of us, and so we're here okay. learning and that. Um, so the Library of Congress, it, in its name, it, it, it sounds like it's not for anyone else, and that's something that we're working on. So Library of Congress, America's Library. Mm -hmm. How do we reach out to other types of libraries? How do we make sure that people see the Library of Congress as a resource for them? whether they're doing serious research or just wanting to find out about things. And so that's, that's our challenge now. And that's the challenge you've... So uh, that's a, a, a challenge that will, I guess, connect you with the public library sector. And that was where you, yes. you began your career in Chicago. Yes. Oh, not, maybe not the very beginning, but early on in, in Chicago. But maybe even before, thinking back before that, uh, um, at what point in your life did it begin to feel natural to you that that was a career aspiration or a sector that you, you could oh. work in? Well, I had an interesting thing? experience as a child. I spent summers in the state capital of uh, Illinois, that's where I'm from, and I didn't realize at the time that my grandparents were taking me to the state library. It was grand, it was wonderful, and the person that they went to um, church with, this Pendergrass, uh, 
you could when I do this when I say Miss Pendergrass, because she was Miss Pendergrass. <laughs> uh, but she attended a church and she worked at the state library. <laughs> and so I had full reign of the state library and the governor's office, company of my grandfather and all that. I had that experience. And then I had the experience in New York when we moved there when I was about five or six of going to a, a storefront branch. Okay. And so I've been involved with libraries for so quite a while. So your very earliest library is a pretty grand was library a pretty grand, experience. but when you're a child, you don't... Uh, we, you don't know. You think all libraries look like that, I suppose. And they're pretty neat. Yeah. <laughs> and that's uh, just... But a storefront a library. Up. Tell us about that storefront That storefront library, library. So what was, the was right there? across the street from okay. Public School 96 in Queens, New York. And after school, you would uh, that, go this was, to this the... Your, right, where right, you were right. School, yeah. and we were in New York. And... I would go there and spend the magic hours from three to six yeah. that uh, a lot of children still do in uh, libraries. Hmm. And one day someone gave me a book called Bright April. And I want, I'll never know who actually did it because I loved that book. It was a little brown girl with pigtails and she was a brownie. And it was the first time I'd seen myself reflected in a book. And that connection, I love that book. I learned about library fines with that book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I just took it out wow. and everything. But that was the power. And then later in life, after and just I for, again for British audience, I don't think we know the book. Is it? It's a oh, story. Oh, it's called is Bright it? April. It's and about it's... a little brown girl. It was a by, uh, by an author, Marguerite D'Angeli, and right. she uh, was writing books for kind of what were then considered outsider children. Uh, children of color, or a Quaker girl, a Jewish child, uh, so all of these groups, and she had a series of books. Oh, okay. So that was that. But I always loved books. My parents were musicians. I am a librarian. That tells you something. Just like they could read notes yes. and hear music, and I realized I could look at text and hear words. So it was a different connection. But later in life, when I was looking for a job, after graduating from college, and I wasn't finding one. <laughs> I had no experience in anything uh, <laughs> except going to school. Um, I would go between job interviews, uh, trying to figure out what I was doing, and in the library in Chicago, okay. the public library. And one of my colleagues who had just graduated with me said, hey, Carla, you're here for the library job. They're hiring anybody <laughs> <laughs> in any degree. It's the library associate program, which we still have in library. Really? Oh, okay. So I went up. That person didn't get the job. I did. <laughs> There's a life lesson somewhere. There is something. <laughs> yeah. And then they put me in another storefront branch hmm. on the in south Chicago, side of really? Chicago yeah. with this lady who was going to graduate library school, and she was on the floor giving story time to children with autism. And she had on jeans, and she had frizzy hair, and she wasn't black, and so, you know, so, I mean, she was really there in that community and connecting with those children, and I said, wow, this is something that might be interesting, and then I said, found out about graduate life, and that it's a profession, <laughs> and it just married the things that I love the most yeah. with trying to help people, too. Interesting, the storefront library, but even tracking back to New York, actually, you talk about the magic hour, yes. three to five in the evening or whatever it may be. Were you, were, were you one of the lone kids making that oh, no. trip across the road? Oh. There's a lot of kids doing that, yeah. Everybody pretty much was, uh, quite a few were going. And I would stop after that and go to the candy store, and then yeah. it was like, wow, and you had your books. And that, so that's and played the meaning, out. As a, a, for tracking back, thinking to that, childhood self, what was the meaning of that library? Was it about a place you could think or feel safe or what? what? It's funny, we talk about uh, the library as a safe place so much now. Mm. At that time, and I'm a little older now, um, but at that time it was like going into a treasure chest. Nobody was telling you what you had to read, you could, go and pick out anything, you could look at it, it just was like, wow. And then I could take them out for free. It's a freedom, it was part of Well, it was freedom. Yeah. And that was the first card you ever had with your name on it, right? Mm -hmm. And you had a transaction with adults, 
you go to the checkout desk and you are responsible. Mm -hmm. Those fines, though, I didn't I'll tell you about. <laughs> well, you that. take responsibility. You clearly feel responsible. Yeah, so you're a little yeah, bit. But that's yeah. that that sense of here's something uh, yeah. that you're doing, and that they're not trying to tell you what to read. That you have the freedom to pick what you want. You made that professional decision. You discovered there was a profession. Right. And, uh, I didn't even know. And it's uh, like magic. This uh, stuff appears. And then, back now from what you're doing now. What what were then the the, the things you began to learn as you became a manager and a leader and began to actually take charge? Because at that point it became serious and real responsibility. And, and it must have begun to think about out. the service in another way. And no? it didn't start out like that. I was okay. perfectly happy doing story time and working with children. Because you, you, you were in Chicago, right, you were involved in the community library, side. Or the, right. yeah, children's and library. then um, I started working with the young adults, mm. the teenagers, and most people Everybody loves the three and five year olds. They're cute, they do what you want, they, they mind. But when they get about 12, they're a little more difficult. And they were looking for people who wanted to work with wow. young adults. And I got into and Did the that. 12 year olds even want to come into the library? Or, or? They, well, they would come in, but they were noisy and they yeah, were, okay. um, you know, they were teenagers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And not as fun. And so that, they were starting serving young adults. And then, uh, they asked me would I coordinate some of those librarians. And so that was my first foray into managing and working with adults. And then that started to evolve into more uh, responsibility like that. And I had to really think, you know, do I want to work directly with the client yeah. or the person or help others do it? So that was a, that was a mental, that, and that was a that was a that was a judgment point for that was a that was a key yeah. element, and then it just kept going okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. in terms of uh, management and that, and so you really, that's uh, not uh, unusual no, no, for no. people in different professions. And a lot, that, that's right, yeah. And you have to make. Do you step away from the front line? Do you right. start thinking more? Uh, Can you still help uh, people? Yeah. By not helping them. <laughs> Directly, and that that was a turning point. And uh, uh, Baltimore, a great ah. city library, a huge, big system, but but a lot I think changed in the time there. So, what did you inherit, and what 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 was the what drew you there, and what was the, the well, challenge you confronted? Well, what was interesting about the Enoch Pratt Free Library, we studied it in library school. It was the first library in the United States, was the first library system yeah. uh, in the United States, uh, uh, the first library to have branches. Uh, in different communities, it was the endowed first library. by an original donor. Enoch Pratt was, uh, a, was Mr. A donor? Enoch Pratt, who was a Yankee from Massachusetts, who made his fortune selling nails and then went into banking, and uh, didn't have any children. And there are legends about him picking up nails uh, down the street because he remembered his father, you know, how hard it was. So he was very thrifty. Uh, very thrifty and became quite prominent and he was part of a group of gentlemen in that time in the 1870s uh, uh, in the, that city that was a, the third largest city in the United States at the time uh, Baltimore uh, that set up one set up a university one set up the art museum so he was and he did the public library mm -hmm. So we, we knew about it was the first library to have um, public relations. Uh, a lot of things came out of the library, but it had fallen on hard times. Um, the city had changed, yeah. and the fate of the city reflected, um, the library reflected that. And so I was getting ready to head the Chicago Public Library. Right? I had been the chief librarian uh, and, and, and commissioner so it sounds very high, and you know, but there's the chief librarian. And um, I don't know if many of you know that Chicago, Illinois has a pretty political <coughs> heritage. Baltimore, the, the, that system, Mr. Pratt set it up, as he said, to be free of politics and religion. Yeah. And they had a separate board and a separate endowment. And so they, they contacted me and said, uh, would you help make this library come back and be that? Could you do it? And it came at a good time. I think Chicago, I was leaving home, 
and all of that, but the idea of that. And then I thought, okay, it's 35 miles from Washington, D.C. I love Washington, D.C., right? <laughs> so I thought, I'll learn about the city. And that's when I realized that when I got there, that city was 35 miles, but 30 million miles away wow. in terms of the communities, what they faced. Hmm. And I was hooked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was hooked. Hooked by the challenge. And, and because in that city, the library was more than a place to get bestsellers. It was more than uh, anything. It was a lifeline to those communities. Wow. Literal lifeline. In what way? Tell me. People were, uh, the school system had been challenged, so it was that those magic hours, three to six, what I had when I was growing up, it was really homework help, children that hadn't had anything to, or wouldn't face any food when they got home, that didn't have people who could help them with just trying to figure out the world, much yeah. less school. Uh, extreme uh, poverty. So the library, for instance, developed a, a virtual supermarket program with the grocery store. People would order their, I mean, it was really basic wow. uh, life safety, plus uh, things like uh, when you think of uh, an area that doesn't have opportunities, how could people apply for a job if 95% of all jobs now require you to file online. Yeah. So people were coming in to actually apply for a job, use the library computers, but they needed help with the applications, so the library staff. So you really knew that it was, you were helping people. Wow, and that, that was the situation you inherited, and what, you, is that right? And, and yes, and it, it, the, the, the fortunes of the city uh, went up and down yeah. over the years until the most recent unrest and, and actual, course. that was really And the library retained national. that, you, which of course we, we heard about here and, and followed. And through that time, the library's aura or significance right at the heart of the community right. grew, is that right? Would yes, you say? And, and we stayed open. So during, right this was during the, the unrest. Epi, yeah, yeah there were the, the one library was right there on the corner that was shown worldwide with the burning cars and the everything. It was right there. Yeah. And we decided to so where open were you? the next were you, day. Were, uh, tell me, how, how, tell me was, about the decision-making. The decision-making like was that. something. The telephone goes. The telephone me. goes. Yeah. Was, we knew it was brewing. Um, and so it, there were two or three days where there were yeah. minor incidents. Remind us what the flashpoint was. For the flashpoint was the death of a young man um, in police custody. And the city had had racial tensions for a number of years, starting from 1968. There were race riots that they still uh, talked about, and houses were still boarded up from 1968 from that riot. So that community had, I'd have to say, festered. Really? Yeah. And was boiling. They had all types of issues. And the police relationship, the relationship with the police had grown uh, even more contentious over time. So when this young man uh, was in a coma first, he, they weren't sure how he uh, received his injuries after he was... Uh, arrested and put into a paddy wagon, as they called it, of that, and he was paralyzed, and then he died. And so there was just this, and the, and the police officers weren't uh, charged with any crime, so it just was it just a lot. And this library had been that lifeline right in that community on a corner. And so when I got the call from the librarian who had sheltered the staff and the public in the library, she, she said, I closed the doors, and then she let them out. She said, but they need us so much, I want to open tomorrow. And I said, well, if you, okay. And I said, but I'll be there too, because you can't ask staff members to do something you wouldn't do. So as I've uh, mentioned, my mom is here. 
So she had worked in social work and had a good role model. But I knew that I couldn't tell her I was going <laughs> really? until like wow. 15 minutes before. So she wouldn't tell me no or I wouldn't. Even, no matter how old you are, you still delay those things um, because you don't want to be told don't go or something. So I waited and all she said was take some water and some napkins. <laughs> And then by that two days later, she was at the front desk giving out fruit and greeting people right. in the community. And it and became the, the light. Came. Oh, they, they were there. They were lined they were up that yeah. morning. Yeah. They had protected the library and stood in front of it and to keep people from vandalizing it. But they said people didn't even try. Yeah. And then it became the food distribution center. It was the only facility open to the public. There were no grocery stores. No, drug stores, nothing was open in that area but the library. And so we, we became that place. It's fascinating how under acute pressure, the values of what libraries are for yes. really reveal themselves. They do. And, uh, and that even back to Pratt talking about the independence from politics yes. or religion or whatever it may be, that was kind of understood. People yes. knew the, 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 that in that role you were not a political role, you were a Civic. It was, it was a it's civic a role. civic duty, and yeah. I noticed that right here in the lobby at the British Library, where you have that sofa. Oh yeah, the, and the that sofa. community engagement and what you're doing really speaks to that public commitment mm -hmm. of a library. That I'd love to see the values and the essence of a public library combined with the rich <laughs> research library, and you, that's what. We're here to see how you've done that. You're listening to the British Library. For more, follow us on YouTube and SoundCloud. So let's let's bring back to the present then. The, you, you, you're there in in Washington D.C. in the magnificent office overlooking the Capitol, and yet your thoughts, I think, are, are, are about how you connect. Yes. Widely across. A, a huge, a much larger, more diverse, even more diverse nation than, than we are. Now, how do you begin to think your ways? How do you, how do you simultaneously stay in the mighty citadel of Washington and connect with public libraries or, 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 or be, take on that national role that you're talking about? And I think when you say stay in Washington, that's like what I'm not going to do. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's what the library is not going to do. Um, mm. It is, and I had to think about this when yeah. I was really honored to be asked to serve okay. as the 14th librarian. And that was the word, to serve. Yep. Because I thought, how could I go from really knowing, standing on a street corner in Baltimore and having that library and opening the door for people and having them come in and knowing to my just bottom of my soul that this was something that was important to do, yeah. that you really were helping people. To this, the world's largest library that's known for its scholarship, what could I bring to that? And how could I help people and serve people, all types of people? And the turning point was when the then president told me about his experience seeing the contents of Abraham Lincoln's pockets uh -huh. and all of the treasures that he was able to see. And he said, but I think some of that was because I'm the president of <laughs> who I am. Uh, what can you do and what would you do to make sure that everyone had that opportunity mm. in some form? And I was hooked again. Very good. And that's the challenge. How do we make everyone, the, the serious researcher and the scholar yeah. that's here looking at your uh, Ethiopian manuscripts from 1600 feel mm -hmm. just as welcome as the young people that were in the workshop yeah. that I attended this afternoon right. learning about dialect. and mm. That's why I know about the word like because he explained it. So I want to use it in a different <laughs> terms. But they were so engaged. And you had one of your senior curators, I mean, top-notch researcher, yeah. engaging these kids from Croydon, I think it was, Croydon, 
and he presented yeah. his research to them in such an interesting way that they were making that connection. So that's what we are looking at. How can we take that expertise and present it in various ways, traveling exhibits, yeah. uh, trucks that are going to go into uh, all areas of the country, mm -hmm. and we're going to have the Library of Congress come to you and your area. And I think, that, to my knowledge, that's the first time Library of Congress will have been... Well, they did it several years ago. Tell us a little bit about the yes. They did it several years ago. It was very successful. Okay. However, it was privately funded, and the funds ran out. Yeah. Uh, and so I have the mock-up of the truck in my office now to give me inspiration because that idea of taking the Library of Congress on the road uh, is very welcome to a lot of communities, and I've talked to uh, public libraries. So making that res um, reach to public libraries yeah. and saying, we are a resource for you. We had a booth at the American Library Association conference last week, and we rolled out all of the things that we could do, but also asked, what do you think we could do for you, too? And so just reaching out. And they gave course, feedback? They, you you oh heard yeah. messages back? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. They signed up. They wanted <laughs> that. But they also are saying you can, and we've experimented with it, say we have a, a wonderful author at in Washington to live stream the author out to communities to be able to have that. So all types of ways to reach out, Very not just to the public libraries, school libraries yeah. as well. The interesting part about the survival of public libraries in the United States is that when economic times uh, happen, the use of the libraries increases because people are using public libraries even more, even when they're financially strapped or their communities are. The federal funding for public libraries has uh, decreased yeah. over time, and most of them have had to do public, uh, private partnerships and private fundraising now, quite a few. Uh, even the college and university libraries are doing more fundraising as part of that. and. With national libraries, we are in an interesting situation because of the uh, perception that the government should entirely fund uh, the institution. And so that's where the public-private yeah, yeah. partnership And again, we probably have a, a similar perception right. there. Uh, and obviously in comparison with some of the, the local or public libraries, these are richly funded organizations, but there's always more oh. that, that can be done and uh, right. and should be done. But eight months in, I'm sensing, even if we haven't met for six months, but uh, even in that time, yeah. the magic of social media, I'm, I'm seeing things happening at Library of Congress that I don't think I'd have necessarily expected before. Uh, whole festivals devoted to disco music, Gloria, well, there was Biblio a discotheque. Component. Was it? There there really there's was. always a research component, yeah. <laughs> and we make sure that we do that. And what But there is a series, because that comes from the collections. It's, have, it's a collections yeah, sure. and things that the library already does. Every year, the Library of Congress selects 25 film and 25 recordings to be put into a national registry for all time. It's like a stamp of approval. And several years ago, uh, the library selected a song by a very popular uh, lady, Miss Gloria Gaynor, and the song was I Will Survive, and it's become an anthem for anything, products. Well, when she was put on the registry, her sales revived. <laughs> she just became quite the thing. And she wanted to help the Library of Congress because she was so grateful. And so there was a, she said she would do a free concert. Wow. And then we said, well, how, we have to tie this in to what we do. So we had an exhibit, we had a workshop. Uh, Tim Gunn, who's a kind of fashion uh, expert on a show, came and talked about fashion of yeah. the disco era, and we brought out all, so we really made it. And then we had 1,200 people we would have had more, but that's the capacity. All shapes, sizes, colors, backgrounds, everything. Uh, dancing to I Will Survive. 
in the Central Hall, and it was quite something. Very good. And I've heard rumors that the Librarian of Congress participated. Well, I in. did. I had a <laughs> little moment. Uh, and what it showed, though, and we had all of the uh, information about our services. Yeah. And almost to a person, people were saying, I didn't know we could even come in here. I didn't know we could get a reader's card. I'll be back. And so we got all of their information, of course, and we started sending them information about our programming. So we followed it up with, uh, there was Pride uh, yes. Week yep. in D.C., and we brought out our items from our collection. Yep. That had and you'll have seen our display here. At the very similar, yeah, yeah. but people hadn't seen it. And then um, there was a comic collect, uh, conference, mm -hmm. comic books, and you have quite a few. We have the world's largest. <laughs> we do have the world's largest okay. collection of comic books. And we had uh, displayed those wonderful items and had Miss Linda Carter, who was the, <laughs> yes. original, the original Wonder Woman. Yeah. Wonder Woman, who lives in the Washington area, wonderful advocate for libraries and literacy. And she came and did a workshop. And it was really something. So people are, there's a little buzz now about. The Library Congress, and we're tweeting. Yeah. We found actually those those media uh, feel very natural for yes. organisations like. And I think it, I think it is truthful to the collections because unlike some of the grand art museums, our collections touch on every conceivable aspect yes. of human life, every bit of society, every voice, uh, and it's about bringing that creativity and curatorial magic to make things happen. And, uh, and we're seeing that happening now in, in your institution more, than, more and more. And one of my most rewarding uh, moments in this kind of quick uh, overview of the <laughs> library and eight months and things came when a young staff member came up to me and said, you know, I use social media a lot. And I felt so proud when some of my friends and colleagues said, hey, the Library of Congress is Getting pretty cool. Uh, you, you, we're, we're following you on Twitter, uh, and I started that though because even though I'm a career librarian and I've known the Library of Congress for years, I don't know everything in the mm. Library of Congress. Yeah. Um, and so after I walked off the stage from being sworn in in September, that's when the Twitter uh, okay. started yeah. because I said I'm going on an adventure. I don't know all the 162 million items, but I'm going to try to find out. <laughs> and that's when it started. So every day or so when I get to go and visit this department or that department or something happens, that's what we put up and then yeah. relate it. And that's, that's been a wonderful thing. And, and we believe, I don't want to make a detour here, but, but uh, there's much debate about uh, these new media formats as things you can collect themselves. And yes. so I think Twitter itself is something that's now finding its way into the servers of the Library of Congress. Right. So. Uh, several years ago, the Library of Congress, when it was apparent that this new form of communication was being used, uh, I think it was the Arab Spring, Yeah. Um, that, that Twitter was used for communication and that, that the library uh, identified that as a potential area of research for scholars later, that how did this new medium inform and, and contribute to this social mm. movement and what happened. And so there's now an archive of about 10 years in those early years mm. that the library is working with Twitter on to see how can you make it accessible to researchers and do that. So that's an ongoing project. And this is a, we, the, 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 on the list of 300 things we should have been talking about, I mean, this is of great interest to us here as we begin to think yes. about the challenge of, uh, of preserving and collecting at least a fraction of this digital ocean that we, we live in. And one of the concerns that I know I'm hearing from historians and scholars and researchers is their concern that a lot of the things that researchers use to show progression or you know, drafts of things are not going to be available 
in this digital world. You're not, people are not preserving like we have the draft of the yeah. Declaration of Independence. Annotated by John Adams, the president that you have a building, he was ambassador here, and Benjamin Franklin. But that draft is important because you can see where they took out the paragraph about slavery. Yeah. And when you see the actual declaration, they took it out because they knew that the declaration would not have been passed if they had, slavery was too, then they said, we'll deal with that later, literally, and took it out. That's the concern of historians now. What is gonna be the historical record now in the digital age as things are erased and refreshed and everything? How are we gonna know what, how things develop? Uh, and, it, and that, it is a profound question. And that, that question around the digital age comes up sometimes from a different dimension. I was very surprised taking on this role, how many pretty educated people would say to me, oh, that's interesting you're doing that really, but it's not really needed anymore, is it? Because we all have what was a library on our oh. mobile phone now, so why on earth do you need these institutions and, and collect? Does anyone, do you ever oh, get that? all the time. Really? Yeah. <laughs> um, and especially during budget hearings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Why are we investing, especially in libraries, as physical places? Yes. yes. Uh, why are you putting on a hundred million dollar extension or renovating a library? Aren't libraries going out of business? I had one gentleman I was on a panel with, I was the only librarian, and so you know how they give the nice introduction, and they, this person and that, and they said, and she has this PhD in library science, and the guy leaned over to me and said, here's my card, um, libraries are going out of business, you might need this. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a good way to start a panel. But there is that public perception that library as place isn't going to be needed. Yeah, we try and refute that on a daily basis and, we, and, and just by the evidence, we, we, as we've invested more in digital, the more people seem to queue yes. up to come through the door here. Uh, and I'd be interested to get your sense of that, we're certainly in, in times of need, and actually this very screen-based age is a collective time of need. There's something that libraries seem to, seem to answer to more strongly rather than less. Um, but you need to, you need, there's an art to making, to making that work, I think, so. Uh, and seeing that play out right here. Uh, yeah. People are sitting next to each other. They, do, they, don't, they aren't interacting, they each have their yeah. device, but there's something about being in a place with others, yep. doing work, and what you have that's, we, we, we've had, we call it envy moments, so many since we've been here. So we just, the one that really got us was how you have King George's Library and this wonderful historic, these bindings and everything, and surrounding that are all of these people on devices and doing work and doing research. That's the epitome of it. Plus coffee and doing yeah. it and just. Now we, I mean, th this is, we feel that's something happening in real time that we're trying to enable and understand at the same time. And it is, and I think that th this is where actually this, the seriousness and meaning encoded into institutions and buildings like yours as well actually comes back to life in a different way because when people feel very unrooted, they're drawn, I think, yes. to communal public spaces that feel where you designed for concentration, communal, you can be sit side by side, and they may not be interacting with each other, right. but I think they're quite powerfully recognizing each other's presence and the seriousness of their individual endeavor if that makes and sense. And that's where the safety and the comfort yeah. and right. being, and also the sense of continuity that when you say people, things are uncertain, yeah. but here you're surround, you're part of a, a longer human journey. Yes. You are surrounded, you might be on your device, but you're looking up every now and then at this, you know you are part of something. And yeah. people seem to find that comfort in that, they want that. And that's what we're all looking at and saying, as we develop spaces, different spaces in libraries that we uh, accommodate that. Yes. And they're responding. 
And what about the other people say that digital is is weakening or loosening people's ability to concentrate or have extended study and uh, attention span and so on? Is that, uh, what's your observation as a, as a librarian around that? It, a lot of it depends on the content of yeah. what they're looking at on the screen. Uh, some of the researchers, for instance, the lady with the uh, Ethiopian manuscripts, oh, yeah. she had the 16th century manuscript, beautiful, <laughs> illuminated manuscripts and her uh, laptop right there looking at the catalog of the materials and being able to bring up through the digital image uh, close-ups of things. So that's where for researchers having the digitized uh, aspect they can examine it in a way that they couldn't and do that and manipulate. So sometimes it depends on that. Now, when you're reading uh, novels, uh, e-books on a plane, one, it's more convenient. Yeah. yeah. You can go back, you can make the type bigger, which I like. <laughs> uh, you can do that. So different types of materials, uh, you are having choices of yeah. which. So print materials, paperback books are doing quite well. Yeah, I was with a, a, a publishing friend today, and the whole book publishing industry 10 years ago thought they were looking into they it were. this. <laughs> and it's not quite like that. History, no. uh, it's going back we're all on. learning never to make too many predictions about any of this stuff. And, uh, but at the moment, e-books, we think, have, have pretty much plateaued. No. Very popular, but, but at a certain level. Uh, and, and I think others, publishing experts here may know, but I think the last statistics I've seen is if you combine a somewhat declined print sales with digital sales on top, there are more books, in fact, yes. being sold uh, than ever And before. you have a so choice now. You yeah, can take a, a, a paperback book on a beach or somewhere like that. You can give it to others. Yeah. Yeah. Book yeah. baskets, this is speaking from experience. <laughs> uh, if you have a guest room or something, you have a lot of paperbacks that people can take. They have all kinds of uh, exchanges or you could put something that you need for work on your iPad, and mm -hmm. you, you have a lot of no, you do. modes of reading now. The underlying everything we've talked about is a, is a principle about free access to information from a trustworthy source. And, and, and whether a library is a tiny street front or Library of Congress, there's a golden thread there. And I guess we've, it, it, it's such a natural thought, we maybe take it for granted, but maybe in, in, in fact in the age of free swirling digital media, I think it's dawned on us recently that it needs protecting and, and arguing for. Is that, does that feel yes, true to you? Yes, it's, and it's one of the bedrock values in yeah. libraries that you are not, uh, making judgments about a person's information needs yeah. or what they're asking for. Though there are and times we would love to know what you want the information <laughs> for, uh, especially some of the yeah. more interesting questions. Yeah, yeah. But in uh, library school, cardinal that's, rule? That is the cardinal you, rule yeah. that yeah. you only ask a person about why they want the information enough to help them get what they yeah. need just enough to, to, to satisfy their need. And the other part is that access and protecting a person's right to know is yes. the phrase. You have a right to know. You have a right to also ask for information and not be judged by your interest because someone thinks you intend to do something just because you've asked for that information. Yeah. And in these times, that's become a balance that we've had to uh, yeah. work on. Yeah. So final question, on, on that point of principle, free information, um, uh, are you feeling uh, for this next generation of Library of Congress in America, people understand it, Congress understand the purpose? and Because uh, we sometimes feel we have to even explain the purpose of a national library uh, here. Same sometimes in the States? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and especially uh, 
when you think of uh, the fact that some legislators, their only contact with a national library or parliamentary library yeah. is to serve and, and Library of Congress. That's one of our yeah, core yeah. missions, yeah. you know, so we're right there. Uh, so we've been really working on making the connections to their communities cool. and inviting them to be there when we live stream and that so they can see the impact in their local communities. And that has really uh, been very helpful. And hence back to full circle, it's America's library it's America's for them. It's America's library. Yeah. And we serve your legislators and they serve you. And it, it, it comes full circle. I think we're going to say you've been very generous with oh, your time, well, you've and been thought, generous. knowledge, and experience. So finally, could everyone please put together hands together? Oh. Thank you. Oh, you've been listening to the British Library. 